don't think of that. But other than that, I mean, it, it should be a dull, boring thing. <laughs> yes, we hope. We hope. <laughs> Because I actually do get some uh, feedback from the DNS servers around the world who are, are, are checking it, and some of them just are not able to check the right keys. CMS, and it's going to be a quick history because it's only been around for 10 months. Um, we're going to go through some of the key features of Backdrop that we inherited. We're going to go over some of the uh, improvements that are unique to Silkscreen itself. Uh, and then we'll take a look at what, I guess roadmap is a good term for it, but I mean, it's not quite as formalized as that. But it kind of glances at the future of uh, what we're planning doing with, with Silkscreen. So first off, just what is it? It is a Drupal-derived content management system. Um, it is forked from backdrop, forked from Drupal 7. Early in the Drupal 8 development, they, they chose a key point in the, uh, the Git repository history to, so they got some features that they wanted, but not the whole symphony object-oriented um, rewrite. Uh, Silkscreen forked from backdrop just before 1.6. This would be January, late December, early January that this happened. It was right around the new year. So Drupal 8 was mostly rewritten from Drupal 7. That's, that's kind of the big problem that we, we had with it. Uh, there's less than 20% code overlap between the two. Um, it's heavily object-oriented, which is fine, but the old stuff wasn't really object-oriented at all. I mean, it used some objects, but they're all defined as standard class for the most part, which makes them more uh, glorified arrays. Uh, they didn't have member functions. They didn't have any kind of inheritance. They, they were just objects that were passed around. Um, it was a, a good stepping stone towards a more object-oriented but it wasn't really object-oriented. Um, Drupal 8 went so far in the other direction to being really completely object-oriented that it didn't know it was PHP. You might think you'd Java. That, that. Uh, it is based on uh, Symfony, which is a, a PHP library that they've got a lot of features in it. It is also very object-oriented and has very little to do with and they were doing this largely to, they were looking to embrace the wider PHP, which is fine, but in the process they ended up taking all the things that they had learned and all the things that they had done in the past and basically dropped it in. So Drupal 8, it's kind of Drupal in name only. It's, and that was the, the people who have been working with Drupal 6 and Drupal 7 for a decade, they were starting from scratch. They were, they were seriously looking at this going, I can learn Drupal 8, I can learn Joomla. It would take me about as much effort to do So Jen and Nate Lambton thought that Drupal 8 was too complex, too heavyweight, too much for novices and for small and medium businesses and, and nonprofits. You know, people who, they want a site to be put up, they want something that has some features to it, more than just five pages for a brochure, but they don't need 
enterprise grade scalability and, and whatnot. They just got a shop. They want to advertise their shop. And the AAA would be just way too much for it. So they forked during the D8 development after content management changes were put in, but before Symphony went and, and turned into a giant object oriented change. I know I'm kind of being mean to Drupal 8 right now, but I don't, it's a very good system. It's just really, really complicated. It's, it's a big change from, from 7, and it's more than most people need. So let's talk about the configuration management part that uh, Backdrop did manage to get in. Um, the old system, if you remember it, Configuration was all stored in the database. There was a table called variables, which was a, just a very simple key value pair store. Um, modules would write out something, and generally they would prefix it with the, the name of the module. So you know, my module underscore enabled, um, enabled feature, or my module underscore name. Um, those are really bad examples. Uh, the problem with that was that copying the configuration about the variables table also held not just the configuration but also a lot of state uh, and it was kind of a scratch space for the site as well. It meant that it was really hard to make some changes in the code and in the way that you want to deploy the next version of the site and push it up because you couldn't really push up configuration as well. You had to go in after the fact and kind of do it by hand. There was a module called features that tried to help automate that quite a bit. Uh, you could kind of define a lot of what you wanted, a lot of changes that you wanted to make and apply them through features. But it really wasn't what features was designed for. Features was great for creating a, if you wanted to create a turnkey, uh, let's say like a newspaper site. And you wanted it to be built so that when someone installed it, they could say, I want to have uh, a front page, okay, we'll turn on the front page set of features. I want to have a classified section. Okay, so let's turn on the classified section. I'll turn on comments. I'll turn on the ability for users to create their own content and maybe a charge for creating a classified ad. So that would add the e-commerce features as well. Uh, maybe we want to have a comics section. So that would add in some graphics and, and images modules to as well. And then you would deploy that as, here's a newspaper uh, content management system all ready to go, deploy it, and then you, you choose which pieces you wanted, and it would just turn on all those features and configure that up, kind of pre-configure everything that you needed. And then from there, you could kind of tweak it to, to your own specific needs. But for uh, just setting up the, the bulk of it, it was pretty good. Developers saw that, thought that it was a great way to just do some configuration management because it actually held a lot of those configuration changes and made it possible to do those, those changes, but it was really bad at backing anything out. Uh, if you had to get rid of a field or get rid of a content type, taxonomy, you just couldn't do it. Difficult to do even in the code, even if you were just in the middle of a release, it was difficult to get rid of. Um, so they wanted to have something that they could do configuration management, put it into a version controlled system, and keep it reasonably separate from the content in the database itself. And so they decided to go with a, this is what Drupal 8 is doing as well, a bunch of files in the file system that maintain the whole thing. Um, Drupal 8 ended up going with YAML. Backdrop went with JSON. Um, and I'm, I'm not sure of the history of that. I, I know that early on in the configuration management initiative, they were a lot of discussion about what format should we be storing it in? Should we use JSON or YAML or XML or something else? Or, uh, PHP serialized. And I suspect that it was JSON at first, and then they decided to change over to YAML for one reason. Um, the modules themselves, in the past, you would do variable get, name the variable, and then you'd put in what you wanted the default to be. If it wasn't in the database already, the default should be unset or empty string or some, some reasonable default. Uh, now the modules themselves hold the, 
default in JSON files. And actually, we can show that. Each of the uh, modules will have a directory called config, and then that will be any of the JSON files they need in order to have your web. This is the, the main system one, uh, system date specific, about the, all the formats, the default formats that are system. Possibly. I don't know about anybody else, but I. There we go, that's much better. <clears throat> um, now the, the upside of this is that when you play something, then you can just say, here are all the defaults for all the, the various variables that we have. It makes it really easy for someone who's developing against a module to say, well, what are the the, the variables that are available to me. What are things that I can look up? You know, formats. What should be the format for uh, a format? And it, it is itself nested, so you can have arrays of things. Um, the downside is that it's a default in the sense that when the module is first enabled, this entire, all these files here get copied into the active configuration space. Uh, when, if there is an update to a module and they add something here, you still need a, a hook update in order to get the new default in there. It, it's not just drop it in and, and, and go. Uh, this is something that actually I, I kind of hope to fix. <laughs> Where are we? Uh, as I mentioned, it can be version controlled because they're just JSON files. You can drop them into, into Git. Uh, you can do diffs against them to see what's changed between the version that you're about to deploy and what's currently deployed. And in doing so, it makes it a lot easier to make sure that you didn't accidentally turn on the debug feature that really shouldn't be on in production. Um, or make sure that someone didn't sneak in some extra configuration that shouldn't be there. Um, there's an active and a staging. The active is what the site is actually using in, in the production space. Staging is some place that you can actually copy everything to, and then when you push up to production, uh, it's basically a pool of configuration files with uh, JSON files that you can say, we're ready to deploy, grab everything that's in staging and apply it into production. So it gives you a nice little, um, it's, it's a way of, of doing the, the deployment, it's possible to do. I mean, a pretty nice, clean. Um, and of course, they're, being that they're just JSON, if you need to change a value by hand, if you know, the site is just so screwed up that you can't even get in, then you can go in, find that one little thing, tweak it, and uh, back to, to working. Or if you are trying to figure out, when I change this value here, what change is it making in the configuration? Well, change the value, save it out run a diff against all the, uh, the JSON files and find the, the one difference. It should be uh, pretty easy to find. So as I mentioned, the out is variable get and variable set. Uh, they're not entirely gone because of uh, compatibility layer that we'll talk about in a bit. Uh, instead, it uses config get and config set. And because it, there are, you don't need to have inline uh, defaults anymore. The config get is what bucket you're pulling it from and then the variable name that you're looking for. So yeah, system core site name, that's just find it real quick. System core is the, the file system.core.json site name, name of the uh, variable itself.
It is possible to do to read down deep into the nesting by using a, a dot format. So system date formats test short pattern here. You remember from the uh, so this is the system date file format. There's a, a test, and then it's just reading the pattern line from that particular. As I mentioned, you don't need any inline defaults because, in theory, everything that you have in the uh, default JSON files from the that are published with the module are already in place. So you the nice thing about that is you didn't ever have to worry about, it. am I consistent in reading it? You'll probably have a number of places where you're calling variable get, but now config get, for the same thing, and you want it to have the same default every time. Well, if you decide that you want to change the default for some reason, now you've got to find every place that was calling variable get and change it across the board. This could be kind of complicated if it's a, not just your module, but a bunch of modules that <laughs> depend on your module and are reading the same configuration variables. So by getting rid of the inline default, it makes everything a lot more consistent, and, excuse me, a lot more stable. Um, the other thing that they added into backdrop since they forked was layouts. So how many of you know what the themes are in, in Drupal? Okay, so the themes were the way that the, uh, the pages were rendered. Uh, it, it would include the masthead, the graphics, <laughs> the CSS, uh, the coloring, fonts, Positioning for a lot of things, uh, the basic structure of the of the pages. I mean, every a, a lot of the the way that the pages were put together was all wrapped up in. Uh, the downside of that was that if you had a bunch of blocks that were in a particular region, because all the regions were defined by the themes, and then you try to change it to another theme, if that re if that new theme didn't have identically named regions the blocks would just disappear. They wouldn't have a, a home to live in anymore. So rather than try to make all the, you know, come up with a standard for all the, the, the regions, because that just wouldn't be workable, uh, they came up with a way of doing layout. So the actual structure of the page is kind of extracted out of the theme. And the theme is now focused on uh, really the look and feel, of the colors and graphics and, and fonts and whatnot less with exactly how many columns and, and sidebars and whatnot. Uh, the blocks get assigned to the layout regions now instead of the, instead of the themes. Um, and the layouts can be chosen based on the page. So we can actually, let me demonstrate this rule. Here's the layouts interface. Can't see that. So there's a path for each of the layouts. This one is just for the front page, and it's going to have the 334 column. Uh, nodes get a, a different, specifically for node edit. You guys can't really read that very well, can you? It gets a very flat, no sidebars or anything. And then everything else is just using a default two column for the pages. If we wanted to have a section for, like, say, a wiki that had its own, Layout, then we just be adding you know, wiki slash, and then everything under the wiki would be in whatever layout we chose there.
So here's one page where we're just, this is from the, the novolog.dev site that we're on. And the full layout has got the content over here, and the sidebars over here. Change this from columns flipped, change it to the other side. Here. If we decide to just change the theme entirely, um, you still have the basic, the same basic structure for the page. Now we just have a different look and feel for the for how it's it's uh, rendered. The layout is actually one of the I think one of the really great features that they added into to Backdrop, and one of the reasons why I'm really happy to be working with that as a, uh, as a content manager. So the real question is, why fork? Um, as I mentioned, Nate and Jen thought that the Drupal 8 was really kind of excessively complex and, and heavyweight. And so they wanted to make something that was really simple and focused on uh, you know, the 80% of the sites that just need a, a fairly basic thing. So they ended up stripping out some things that slightly more complex sites might want to have. Uh, Postgres was supported in Drupal 7, it's supported in Drupal 8. Yeah, barely any sites actually use it, but it's gone. Uh, MySQL is pretty much the only thing that they support. For the configuration management, it's all written in JSON files, and there's really nowhere else that you can put it. Uh, I was looking to put the configuration into the database for a couple reasons. One, it's a little safer to keep it in the database than in files because those files live on the webhead itself, not in the backend database. The database itself tends to live on a server that is behind a firewall, so it's less accessible. Uh, and also, when I'm doing development, sometimes I need to just you know grab the current state of the site and pull it down and put it into my local environment and find out what's going on with it. That is the starting point for the next deployment or figure out a bug or, or something like that. And being, having to copy down both the configuration files and the database, I know it sounds kind of petty to say, oh, I've got to do two things instead of one. But there is a, a separate sync that you have to end up doing and keeping them uh, together. So, and it seemed like we already had a configuration storage interface. I mean, there's already a class that was built for that. So all I needed to do was write one that was database-based and throw in a little bit of glue code in order to be able to select database instead of files and, you know, Bob's your uncle. I submitted that up to them in a PR and they decided that they wanted to keep the site as simple as possible and didn't want to put that in. Uh, now, I'm not going to say that they rejected it or declined it or any kind of you know, hard stop kind of terminology because Jen's been pretty uh, strong on the point that if there's a serious need for it, if it's something that the community will react and reacts really positively to, they'll consider putting it in at a later date. But I needed it then, so I can either just track my own set of, of patches for it uh, but these were some fairly uh, disruptive patches down into the, the bootstrap layer. So I'm going to be tracking uh, patches, then I might as well give it a name. If I'm going to give it a name, then I've got a project. If I've got a project, well, now I need a, a logo, and now I need a website. And, and yeah, that kind of goes, you know, if you give a mouse a cookie, it kind of snowballs from there. Um, but yeah, I ended up saying, I need to be able to put the configuration in the database, and I want to be able to do Postgres as an option. And there's some other things that I'd like to be able to do that just are not going to, to make the cut. So 
I can support them. Um, I do rather appreciate the, the work that they have and the, the product that they have. And I want to keep working with them and, and keep up with it. So I forked it in, in the sense of uh, the press flow fork. You guys remember that from Drupal 6. Pressflow was a, a fork of Drupal 6 that had some performance and caching improvements in it that were a little too much to go into 6. Most of those changes ended up getting into Drupal 7. Uh, but they, they're just too disruptive for, for 6. So some guy said, we're going to keep these patches. We're going to call it Pressflow. Anytime there's a new release of Drupal, we'll just take any changes, any uh, diffs that they had, apply them to Pressflow as well, and put it out with the same version number and everything else, and it will be you know, a drop and replacement for Drupal 6. So I'm, I'm doing the same thing. I'm making it a uh, literally a drop and replacement, tracking all the changes that they're making. They put out version 1.8. A week or so later, I put out version 1. All the, the same changes in it. So the, the two people you're referring to, they're, they're the developers of Backdrop? They are the main, the core maintainers of it, yes. And, and you're the core maintainer of, uh, of Silkscreen. Silkscreen. That's correct. Um, going through a, a comparison of Drupal 8 versus Backdrop versus Silkscreen. Um, 8, completely rewritten. Um, if you any of the modules that were there before, they need to be rewritten as well. It would be a pretty facile little module that barely did a, a hook form alter that would not need to be ported. Everything else needs some pretty significant work in order. Uh, for Backdrop, they included a Drupal 7 compatibility layer. The modules mostly kind of run as is. Uh, as with anything that is you know, PHP based, if they stick well to the standards and the APIs, then it'll probably be a pretty clean, easy uh, port over. You'll need like two lines to just say, Backdrop, yes, you can load this too, it's okay. Um, if they really got kind of messy in their PHP, how many of you guys have had to do PHP rescue projects? Nope, oh, okay, well, that's a <laughs> PHP rescue project. Every now and then I get a client that has a site that's done up in PHP and whoever was writing it before yeah, they were clearly learning it. Um, so yeah, I kind of couch it as a mostly runs as is because there's all kinds of things that can go wrong. But for the most part, Drupal 7 modules just run. The, the APIs are, are maintained. Uh, if there is something in, say, one of the modules that is trying to read from a variable that another module writes that's already been ported, well, it might not find in the variable get table anymore. Variable is still around. Variable, as I mentioned before, variable uh, get and set are kind of, they're out in the sense that they've been deprecated. But the variable table still exists and variable get and set still work. And that's entirely so that Drupal 7 modules can write their configuration to variable as they were before without a problem um, and read it back. But if they're looking for a variable that another module writes, like if they're looking for system site name, system site name doesn't exist in the variables table anymore. It's been moved over to, to JSON, so they'll lose that. Uh, Drupal 8 supports MySQL, Postgres, and SQLite. Backdrop is kind of drop back to only MySQL. And I've got Postgres working. I've got a big star next to SQLite because version 1.8, which came out last week, included a bunch of database changes, and the SQLite driver has not been upgraded, it hasn't been uh, brought up to date. But the, the base is, is there. Drupal 8 puts all the, the active config in, in the database, and the staging config in a bunch of YAML files. Uh, Backdrop has all of its configuration in JSON files. It, uh, staging, active, anything at all, it's just JSON is the only way that you have to do it. Um, I went with a more flexible configuration management, and we're going to be talking about that in just a minute, uh, where you can stick it into the database, into files, into memory, um, and just by defining a new configuration storage class, 
find you know, a new way of putting it in. And we'll talk about some things that we're going to be doing. Drupal 8, really complex. You're not going to put up a Drupal 8 site by yourself. Uh, you, you kind of need, I mean, if you're really technical, then you, you could probably do it. But a small business, they need a technical team. They're not going to be able to manage it and their business at the same time. It's just not possible. Um, and if anyone's telling you that, oh, sure, it's, it'll be a simple port from Drupal 7 to Drupal 8, there'll be cost overruns. Bet on it. Um, Backdrop, they have made a point of making it simple and easy to manage. And they have actually done a really good job of, of that. They've got people on their core team, uh, they call it the PMC, I forget what that stands for, though, that are specifically there to be the user constituent. Uh, they're there to represent basic users that are trying to use it, the, the small mom and pop shops. They tend to be less technical people, uh, but really, um, I don't want to say enthusiastic, but that sounds kind of, they're there they're, they're really just to, to represent the, I'm trying to go with a little more of a, a balance of simple and but it's still feature rich. And you know, one analogy, you think of backdrop, backdrop's kind of a claw hammer uh, in, the, in a world of nails, it's a, it's a claw hammer. It's a good solid tool, it does what you need, it'll, make, it'll get the job done. Sometimes it's just not enough, and you need a, a good sledgehammer, and that's gonna be more of silk screen. Um, Drupal 8 is an industrial pile driver like what they're using outside to build a building across the street. It is way more than you need for, for most. And you know, their, their target audience batches. Drupal 8 is really, I mean, it, when you look at their uh, marketing now, they are entirely talking about enterprise class CMS. Um, Jen and, and Nate, when they're talking about backdrop, they are talking entirely about small and medium businesses and nonprofits. Um, and I'm going for kind of, there's a nice middle between those two, and that's, that's where I'm targeting. Uh, so as I mentioned, back, uh, worked in the tradition of press flow. Incidentally, when I first took it, I was thinking, I want to do this, I want to do it in the uh, tradition of press flow. I need a name for this new CMS, though. So backdrop, press flow, what would be the name? Backflow is an awful name, do not use this. <laughs> but I own those domains. Um, so you yeah, put together a parallel repository. I've got my own uh, fork in, in a separate Git repository. Uh, Any time that they have a backdrop release, I try to get it out within the next week or so, you know, taking all their patches, putting them in, running all the tests to make sure everything is clean and, and you know, tweaking whatever needs to be tweaked. Uh, back to, to, to all green across the board. Um, one date was a little late because there was some database tests that were just really being a pain. Um, it is a drop and replacement. If you are running backdrop and you decide that you know, I need to have some extra features, I need to have that you know, configuration in the database, I need to be able to use Postgres or SQL. Just drop it in as though you're doing an upgrade from uh, backdrop to it, and it, it just works. Um, I do continue to contribute to the backdrop uh, project, and at this point, some of the patches that I have are a little on the simple side, you know, a, a trivial fix to a, a test somewhere. Or something like that. But every release of backdrop, I've got at least one patch in. As I go through and, and add things into silk screen, if it's not a patch that depends on a patch that has already been uh, passed over, then I'll, I'll send it up to them as well. And for the most part, they, they take them. If it fits their, their needs. Uh, and if it doesn't, then, you know, then I'll just keep it in mind. And that, that's fine. I have no problem with that. So one of the major things that we did in order to get things like the different configuration management stuff in there and uh, databases we wanted to be able to do it as contrib files. And actually, when just before I, I forked, uh, when I was trying to get the original configuration management in the database stuff in, 
Uh, Jen mentioned, you know, if we could do this in contrib, as just a contrib module that you drop in and turn on, that would be that would make things a lot easier because then you know I could have the contrib module and and we wouldn't have to worry about it being part of the, the backdrop core. Well, the problem with doing contrib modules for something like configuration, contrib modules are stored in the database or the, the, there's a system table in the database that says here's the list of all the modules and there's a status column that says whether it's turned on or not uh, and some other metadata about it. And you really can't have the configuration in the database um, you end up with this chicken and egg problem of I need to be able to get to the database in order to do it, but I can't do that because I don't have the config up, and, and so it just didn't work out. So we came up with a concept of adding a driver's directory, where it's not a, there are modules, sort of, but they're not listed in the system table. They are just kind of, if you drop a driver into that directory, it's on, it's present. Uh, and during the early bootstrap, that's a set of modules that get pulled in just by default and uh, very early on so that they're always available. Uh, implicitly, yeah, implicitly enabled. Um, there's a little bit of a difference in structure to them. Take a quick look at that. But, you know, the driver for MySQL, normally there's just, uh, Here's the info file for the system module. Um, version type module tells it what version of the, the core is there. Uh, some paths on that configuration. Uh, you can also have, others will have, uh, let's see, we might have some style sheets and, and some other things. The uh, drivers have kind of the same thing, a name and a description, but it then says, I'm a database driver, and for MySQL. And then the classes that you need in order to make me run, here's the list. And we need this in order to do basically prime the uh, autoloader, the class autoloader uh, for that particular database or for whatever it is. And it just makes uh, running everything a lot easier. You can just kind of say, pull in this, add the, the class list to the autoloader. If we ever need, as soon as we need a class for a particular thing, the autoloader will fire and pull up the, the uh, and include the right, um, right class file. So yeah, they have a, a slightly different structure to them uh, and they are, they have to be implicitly in, enabled. Um, for configuration management, storing it in the, oh, this is just, we've gone over this already. Uh, it's storing the database and the configuration in the database, that you have a common location for it. You don't have to worry about, uh, it's on this web head, but it's not synced yet over to the other one, because as soon as you write to the database, all the web heads can be um, protected. Uh, can thing. So the way that you set up, configuration in backdrop, they've got a variable called config directories. Active is the one that is currently in, in use. There's another one called staging, which they use specifically for where you want to have the stuff that is about to be put into production. And for just the file stuff, it's just the path of the, the directory. It might be in the files directory itself. You might also put it one directory up from the root. This is all relative to the root. Uh, of, the, of the site. So I want to put it one up because one up from the root is typically not served by the web server. So it's a little more protected. Um, when you're doing it with a, a database, if you turn on the config database driver, then all, you're just changing it from a file name to essentially kind of a URL. Say, in this database, connection, which is by default the default one. Look for this table, and that's where we're going to shove everything. Uh, 
Uh, the database configuration storage, I've modeled it entirely after the file config, um, including a lot of the file semantics that you wouldn't normally stick into a database. So the, attempt, the thing was to make it quark for quark compatible. And it's just, I take the JSON blob that we would normally be writing out to a file, I put it into a text field into, into the database. If you were going to write this from scratch, you would not do it this way. That's not the way that, it, it's no longer searchable. Uh, you lose a lot of the, uh, the features that you'd get from, from having it in the database. But I really wanted to make it as identical as possible. I mean, to the point where there's a column in, in the uh, configuration table for the C time, because that's what they're using in order to decide which version of a configuration file is the more current one. Um, in a future version of the site of uh, Silkscreen, I'll probably swap out the database for a database version two. That will just put each configuration element in its own in, in its own row. Um, there's also some consideration for using something like NoSQL, being able to store configuration in a NoSQL database, uh, since you know NoSQL is really built brilliantly for kind of key value pairs, that would it'd be a good fit for, for managing the configuration as well. Um, back in Drupal 7, there's a way that you could do an override. You, you had all the configuration in, in the variables table. But for some times, especially if you're doing like site development, you want to force off Google Analytics, for example, or you want to force off on uh, HTTP basic auth module. And you could do that by basically saying dollar conf, the variable name, and then give it a name. You suck that into the settings file, and it didn't matter what was in the database, this overwrote it every time. Uh, you could write the value to that field, but it wouldn't show up here, obviously, because that's just hard coded in the code. It would end up in the database itself. It just never would be used. Uh, for book screen, we created a, a memory config uh, storage object. And it works in kind of the same way, except that because of some technical reasons, not all variables are passed through to the main system. Not everything gets put into the, the global space. But there is a, a settings config variable that is. So when we're configuring up the memory version, we say memory mem config. And then we just, whatever key we use here, that's the key we need here. And we can put all the overrides in kind of a JSON array system core, as you recall, that's the file name. And then all the uh, variables in it. Now, you might be looking at this and saying, wait a minute, this isn't going to work. Because if you're setting the active to memory, then you haven't got anything. Having where to live. So you'd have to basically put all of the configuration in memory, in which case, that's, that's not really a storage area. So we added a layered config storage to work through that. And here's how it works. You define a memory-based one and a file one. Give them, don't put it into active, put it into two other things or just name something different. And then you turn on the layered one and say, Layered memory on top of active files. So now any time that there is a, a read, it's going to try to read first from memory, from that, that memory definition that we had from here. Uh, so your site name would be overridden, because it would find that first. And if it didn't find it in the memory one, it moves on to active files. And if you want to do a third one, then it on there as well. I and mean, just you know, as many layers as, as you want. Um, when it's doing a, a write, the writes go to the first layer. Uh, the configuration object for memory is marked as an immutable.
and that pretty much uh, mimics the There's some other CM storage things that are in progress or, or uh, on the on the roadmap. Um, a default one. I want to write one that is using the file stuff, but rather than looking in a particular directory for it, it's going to look in every active module and pull all the JSON files from that. Uh, we end up using the the defaults as a bottom layer. Defaults would end up being a bottom layer here, so that you don't find it in memory, you don't find it in the active, and that should make it the because it's changing. Published with it's it's means you don't have to have the same thing done in two. Uh, the other one that I want to do is something that writes configuration to a variable in the user session, which is something that would be useful if you want to say, I've got a demo site, I want to show off some something, give the world full access, full admin access to it, but I don't want them to just kind of co-opt it and take it over. So anything that they write, will stick that into the, their session. So they can see it, and they can muck around with it all they like, but someone sitting right next to them wouldn't see it at all, because it's entirely locked into their... Does that make sense? Um, we also want to use this... You guys, how many of you guys are called domain? Domain access was a, a pretty nice module for Drupal 7, and, and actually I think it was as well, that uh, took a multi-site one step further. You could have multiple sites that had the same backend, or the same content, or could use what content was present. Uh, was there any common configuration within a particular site could have a I ended up using this for a client that had a whole bunch of conferences. And it held about a dozen conferences. Uh, so we had most of the content uh, in so shared across. But they had the same presenters. Uh, they would present at multiple conferences. So uh, someone's bio would only show up once. If one day you make a change to the bio, there it would change across all the sites. Uh, but each site also has its own. In order to do that, you have to basically have a base layer of configuration. And then on top of that, the, this site-specific overrides to that. And so we're looking to use the, the layered to get the domain access. That's just one of those features that I think is just popular enough in Drupal. That I just don't see how we could possibly do it. Backdrop. For database options, I've got the, uh, as I mentioned, most of the tests pass right now, and that's what I was working with to get uh, 1.8 out. Uh, there are some locale tests that are still broken. Um, but I need to get it out, and those weren't going to get fixed. Anymore. The SQLite driver, again, I put a giant star on it because it needs to be updated. Sorry, back up one eight included some.
and a lot of modules that could be baked into the eight model. Uh, the SQL, there was a bunch of things that if driver equals Postgres, this SQL. If driver equals MySQL, said default to probably I think the MySQL hope that it works. Um, or when I, we they try to keep the code as so we took a lot of that code out of the data module and shoved it down into the, the database drivers. And right now SQLite just doesn't have the uh, the other thing that we want to put into place are cache drivers. Um, because cache is another thing that loads up so early on in the boot. Crap. In fact, it loads up oftentimes before the database. Because if you pull it out of cache, then you don't. So we got the the default drivers that are in place. Uh, but it's also that it should be a lot easier to copy them cache into. And I'm hoping that by making it such a that we just take the cache module, you drop it into the drivers, turned on, active. That will be a lot easier to configure up than seven. You guys have not done any cache configuration in seven. It was quite a pain. You had to go in and, and fire up a lot of things in settings. In order to get it to, to work at all, and probably um, that we can get the, the drivers to have some configuration in themselves and, and just make it easier. That's kind of going to be the, the focus of 1.9. So, three to 1.9, we're really looking to focus on the, the cache drivers. Uh, the other things that we want to do the yeah, idea yeah, off framework. Right now, we can pull usernames and passwords from our own local database, but really from nowhere else. We're trying to reinvent the wheel, and they didn't really play well together. If you try to do two, if you try to do some kind of multi-factor, you're you're really on your own. Um, so you can do multi-factor very easily. Um, we're also looking at in the future doing what we call compatibility. So again, one of the issues that we had with Drupal 7 when it first came out, uh, there was a rich library of Drupal 6 modules, and barely any of them ported up for Drupal 7. And it was over a year before there was enough Drupal 6 modules ported to Drupal 7 that Drupal 7 could really be considered uh, ready for prime time. Um, that was really inhibiting the, the adoption of 7. I've got a compatibility layer. We'll just work with it. That way, the entire library of stuff that we have for Silkscreen 1 will be day one available for Silkscreen 2. Hmm? There's going to be an awful lot of things that are, that are complaining at, hey, you're calling this function that's deprecated. You really want to fix that. By the time Silkscreen 3 comes out, that'll mostly be gone. Silkscreen 3 will not load up Silkscreen 1 modules. Uh, if you try to call anything that's deprecated in 2, it's just not going to work in the same way that any other deprecated thing. It's just not going to work. Um, I figure that you know, a, a full major release cycle, though, should be long enough for people to either upgrade the modules or just abandon them. And it gives uh, people sites enough of a warning that, you know, we're getting close to three. This module is still a version one module. We need a plan B for it. So on the ID auth framework, username, password, we've got that. It'd be nice to pull from external sources like LDAP. Uh, we want to be able to do OAuth and you know, third-party site logins. 
uh, crypto tokens, the, the time-based one-time passwords, the um, put in the, you know, pull up your little token and, and there's a six-digit number and, and write that into a field. Uh, SSL certificates and CAT cards, because a CAT card is basically just an SSL cert on a chip in your pocket. Um, and then also something like terms and conditions acceptance, a multi-factor quote-unquote authentication piece so that you go through, you have to say, yes, I agree to the terms and conditions. And if you don't, you're not logged in until you do. You, you don't exist in, in the system until you do. Uh, this is actually a, a feature that one of the guys on the uh, backdrop forums was asking for. Now, the catch is getting a framework that can do all of these things is free IPA does it. I'll have to look into that and see how it's. Yeah. Yeah, the, the uh, framework that I'm building up, I'm looking a lot at uh, PAM and how it's done. A, a split between identity versus uh, authentication. I'll have to take a look at it. Because um, one of the other things that we'll have to be able to do and separating out the identity from the authentication is, you know, a step towards this. Uh, when you're, say you're an admin, you need to take a look at a user's account. You need to be able to load up the user's data, which might be in an LDAP, might be in a different server entirely. Um, might be just cached locally. But you need to be able to do that without actually logging in. Okay, I'll have to take a look at free IPA and see so what you it. You don't have any logic in your own code to satisfy. Me. There might be some. Well, I'll take a look at it. Um, and of course, just being able to do a, a multi-factor mix and match, you know, pull from LDAP and then do a TOTP and then do a terms and conditions acceptance. You know, being able to layer all three and you don't get logged in until you have all three done. So that's kind of the, what we're looking at to, to build for uh, the ID auth framework and make it so that it's easy to just drop in a module. It follows an API. Uh, there's a configuration page for the, uh, the admins to enable and probably even set up paths because you know maybe it's there's another option on the same site TP then because you already have the the, the crypto stuff uh, and then you just need to jump straight down to the terms and conditions so you know different paths for what considers it, what do we consider to be a valid login uh, mix versus you know, to have to turn on everything and, yep, that's all I've got. So kind of rambling there, I apologize. So, for an old school guy like me, um, how do you differentiate between um, A portal is built on top of something like this. This is the, the tool that you would use in order to, to build something. Um, I guess if you are going into this cult of the concept of a content management system, then you've probably spent the last hour going, I don't get any of it. 
Uh, the content management system, just you know, in 30 seconds, is a way of taking a bunch of different pieces of content and then relating them to each other, filtering it based on the user's uh, access layer uh, levels, uh, and then you know, rendering that all up into a, a single page. So you might be, if you're a newspaper site, each article that you have would be a piece of content. Each bio that you have for every reporter would be a piece of content. Uh, and then you would relate the bios of the reporters, or you know, the reporters themselves, which has a bio as a field, to the articles that they're writing. So you'd be relating content in that way. You might relate various articles together as a you know, local news versus national news versus technology news versus business news. Um, and you could use some tagging in order to say what pieces of content fall into what buckets. You would, well, actually both, because um, the back end of the content management system is what's handling all those building blocks. And then the theme layer up top is what takes all those building blocks and then says, structures the page and, and puts the pieces in place, and renders the, the page itself. So it- You could use uh, silk string to build. In fact, you would, yes. Yeah, if you're building a site, you know, if you're an electronics company and you have a bunch of products that you need to support, then you'd have um, support articles that are just kind of a, if you run into this problem, then here's the answer. You know, one field would be description of the problem, and another field would be the description of how to get it to work. Can you show, for instance, how to add content? Yeah. In a database, typically. Um, although, for its, well. Right. I'm going to turn this around so I can. So in this case, we're just going to create a, a post. And a post is a particular content type that is designed to be a little news bit or uh, something that is we put up on the Novolog site to say, hey, we've got this thing that's about to happen. Um, come check it out or, or you'll Oh yeah, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> 
<laughs> and that, that's not too far from the uh, from reality. Um, now you're asking, does it live in the database? Does it live in files? And th the real answer is kind of a mix. Uh, this field here, that's going to be in the database. That's going to be in the database. But if I upload an image to it, it's just going to stick that into the onto the uh, as a file itself. And there'll just be a, a field that says, when you need to pull this graphic, it's in this file over here. Go grab it. And then everything else down here is just some metadata about it. Should it be published or not? Should it be promoted to the front page or not? Uh, if we have a list of items, should it be stuck to the top of the list? Is it you know a, a, a pinned post of some kind? Um, who authored it? You and we can by default it's whoever's logged in, but there's no reason why you couldn't change it to someone else if you have the uh, um, permission to do so. Mm-hmm. Yes. Um, the themes are what are called responsive themes. So this here is what you see here is the desktop version of the site. But if you just shrink it down, The menu changes from, you know, here's a normal menu. It changes to more of a, a phone-friendly drop-down. Uh, and there's like two or three breakpoints, one for tablets. There's one change out, and here's another one. Yes. Um, inherited from, I think, from Drupal originally. And Drupal got it from some, probably from some JavaScript library itself. So it's mostly just a bunch of JavaScript that is looking at the page and, and some changes in CSS, uh, some conditional CSS saying, if my screen is this big, then apply the CSS uh, rules. Yeah, the, the JavaScript is going to be there to change the menus in a one. Doesn't have to be in this. Nope. This, this is the cool thing. It's actually people all do. Yeah, yeah. yeah. You don't even know how to do that. Lots of them out there tells you how to settings. What you probably want to do is what John's talking about, is find a framework. Would you like to give uh, Silkscreen a, a try? Okay. There is Drush for backdrop. I know that there is some active development on that. Uh, as far as I know, it would work just fine with, with Silkscreen. Uh, the latest versions of Drush are all using Composer to pull in all the libraries it needs. And that kind of leaves me feeling like I'm, I'm just going for the bug of the day every time I run Composer update. Um, there's another thing that 
uh, for backdrop, and we'll probably rename it to Silk for Silk Screen. Uh, that is kind of like Drupal Console that doesn't require anything f except you know PHP and the, the B command or you know package and everything else. So it's going to be a lot more like old school Drush that didn't need all the composer stuff, but does a lot of the same things. Of so you want to download. Uh, okay, so Drush is a command line, a command line tool for uh, Drupal. Thanks for Drupal shell that made it very easy to download a new module name. And it would go out to drupal.org, find the pro appropriate uh, project, find the Drupal 7 version, copy it down, and unpack it into the, the modules directory. Uh, you could then turn it on by saying, drush enable, new module name. And it would say, OK, we've got this module. Oh, it has some dependencies. Do you want me to go grab the dependencies for it now, too? OK, yes. Pull down all those and then everything in one fell. Uh, it made managing and doing development on Drupal so much easier. Um, if you need to clear caches, because that's like, if there's something wrong with Drupal, clear the caches. That will nine times out of 10 fix it. Uh, so there's a command in Drush or just Drush clear cache all. And when you're doing development, you end up running that an awful lot. Uh, there's another one that we use. Just fell out of my head. Sorry. Um, but yeah, for for oh cron. Um, if you want to just run the the cron jobs on a Drupal site, because oftentimes a Drupal site will have a once every hour uh, look and see if there's any pending emails that need to be sent out and send them out, or you know tally up all the hits on this particular page and update the the statistics or something like that. Um, running cron through the, the browser, kind of, you end up running into some issues with the, uh, the web server itself saying you can only run for two minutes or whatever. You can only take up so much memory. But if you're running from the command line, then you can do essentially indefinite amounts of time, and you're not tying up someone's connection. Um, Drush has a, a Drush cron, and that was oftentimes put into just a cron job in the system in order to run all, all the cron stuff. So it just it, Drush is an incredibly useful thing, and we wanted to make sure that we had something similar to it, so that's where uh, the B uh, Drupal console kind of thing is coming from. Yes? So yeah, yeah, and they have a hosting side. They they <laughs> uh, they do actually have an awful lot of support that they provide for uh, for sites and site building, but they also have a, a hosting side um, for for Drupal eight, um, and they, essentially they're just reselling Amazon like anyone else, but they have a pretty good. Uh, configuration management thing where when you set up a, a site with Acquia, you have a, a dev, a staging, and a production site. You can't copy up databases to the, to the production site because you might screw up everything. But you can always copy them down to, from production to dev and staging. So you can grab a, a snapshot of the, what you have in production and, and um, test out your deployments or whatever. Um, would I go that route? Possibly, if I have enough free time or if I can find someone that can manage a lot of the infrastructure, because that's a, an awful lot of, okay, granted, it's mostly just writing up an Ansible playbook and making sure that it's running and, and have a web server that people can deploy new sites with and then, you know, give me their credit card number. So, possibly, yes. <laughs> I've considered. Um, it's just... Not on the, the near-term radar, not unless you know, I get a lot of uh, people asking specifically for silk screen hosting. Because right now, you just need a basic LAMP stack. You can stand it up on DreamHost as easily as you could anywhere else. It's 
website development, I don't even think I actually dive in any way. Website development or a uh, tool developer who's out there saying, well now, what's the next tool the world needs? Ah, I mean, um, years ago I was helping uh, a nonprofit put together a website for a business plan competition. And I'd heard about all kinds of CMSs and I figured, okay, let's give one of these a try. And I grabbed a copy of Joomla and I put it up and we built the site with that. And I hated it. Uh, every piece of content in there had to have both a primary and a secondary category. And for a lot of things like, you know, an about page, it's like, there isn't a two layer thing. It's just a page. I mean, come on, this is more than, than I wanted. Uh, finding modules for it that didn't like screw up all kinds of things was just a pain in the in the butt. Um, it just wasn't very good at all. So when I did the next project for that same nonprofit, putting together just a, a rebuild of their website, I reached for Drupal instead and started working with that and fell in love with it immediately. Uh, that was around Drupal 6.10, 6.12, somewhere in, in that time frame. Uh, did some work with a, a guy that I met. I was working in a coffee shop on some code. He was chatting very loudly on his cell phone about how he was trying to get a site put together and couldn't get in touch with the, uh, the developer that he was trying to <laughs> contract for it. I said, let me send you a proposal. <laughs> Ended up building a Drupal 6 site for him. Um, from there, just kind of started doing Drupal stuff in general. Uh, went from six to seven, and there was a bit of a learning curve, but it was it was functional, uh, and the the features and, and improvements that they had in in Drupal were certainly in seven, were you know certainly a big step up from six. Uh, then Drupal eight came out, and I didn't even recognize it, and I thought this is this can't be right. Discovered Backdrop, and that you know they had basically the same response to it, and you know. Nate and Jen are pretty high level uh, Drupal developers themselves. Nate is the maintainer of the web form module, which is uh, one of the major modules out in the, in the Drupal world. And I think there's actually a, I think he had a company that was actually built all around the web form for a while. Uh, he works at one of the, the major Drupal studios right now. Uh, Jen Lampton, was the lead for the Twig initiative in Drupal 8, which was a, a basically a rewrite of how the theming layer worked in Drupal 8. So they, they both know 7 and 8 very, very well inside and out. And so when they said, you know, we need to have something that's simpler for, uh, for nonprofits and, and small businesses, they, they knew what they were talking about. And I took a look at what they were doing and said, yeah, this is exactly what I'm kind of thing I'm looking for. Backdrop really is what Drupal 8 could have been. Drupal 8 I consider to be what Drupal 12 or 14 would be if they went out with a normal evolution of things. It was just too much too fast. So yeah, I was doing that and then working with, with uh, the Backdrop guys and I needed something a little bit more than what they had and now I've, now I've got silkscreen. <laughs> uh, no, there's basically me. <laughs> right, right now there's basically me, but I will always accept patches. Uh, if there are people who are interested in, in contributing to uh, Silkscreen, you know, I'm, I'm happy to, to entertain them. And it's up on GitHub, uh, GitHub slash Silkscreen CMS. Uh, you can find the code there and fork it from there. Um, that said, if it is something that would work equally well with Backdrop, I would actually encourage you to go talk to the Backdrop guys and work with them. Because anything that goes into Backdrop is going to end up in Silkscreen one way or another. So the, are there, is there a, or is it just so new that really it's, it's you and we're the first to hear about it? Uh, marketing and getting the word out is a, a major issue that I, I need to attack. So. You guys are not the first ones to hear about it, but it's a pretty, 
early adopter would not be a, an unfair reward for, uh, for you guys. Um, it, I'm trying to use it for my own, obviously, silkscreen, cms.org runs silkscreen. Uh, the other site that I have for my company, Sentai Digital, is currently still running Drupal 7, but as soon as I upgrade it, it's going to be upgraded to, to silkscreen. Um, Tux.org is getting silkscreen. Novalug is going to get silkscreen. Uh, in fact, that's what you're looking at up there was a silkscreen version of, of Novalug.com. Um, I've got a couple clients that needed a CMS, and so I just deployed it for them because, because. Um, and they are either none the wiser or happy with it. <laughs> so, really, it is. You know, it, it doesn't cause me problems. I like it. <laughs> I, I think you'd know if they weren't happy. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, in the back, because you've been raising your hand. John. Enterprise. They're looking for the enterprise market. Not there was you know, there's a, a Git history, but there's an awful lot of if you look at what it is today and what it was at seven, you're not going to recognize one from the other. I mean, there's some some key phrases that are the same between the two, but it's it's pretty radically different. Uh, and yeah, the enterprise market is what they're they're going for. Drupal got used for a couple of big sites like WhiteHouse.gov, and um, it became very popular, especially in this area. I think I think basically what happened was like WhiteHouse.gov used it, and then a bunch of other agencies looked and said, "Hey, that was a pretty successful project. Let's go with Drupal." So it became useful for uh, agencies and for congressional offices and, and all kinds of other uh, federal Oracle stuff. Saying they be yeah, well, Oracle is Oracle. Jumla? Jumla. see there going, uh, going around and trying to solve that conundrum. Uh, so if you wanted to use silkscreen, for example, me, uh, well, I have to It's... It is the top part of a LAMP stack. Uh, Linux, Apache, MySQL, PHP. Um, if you've got all those four components on your local development environment, then yes, you can just build Silkscreen here, commit it to a Git repository, and deploy it up to whatever hosting. Right. Not the content. Well, you can copy the database from local up as well. So that at least means a question I get very often. Right? So you have a traditional development or QA environment where you come up with new ideas. Mm -hmm. Production that has its own content. And mm -hmm. changing. How do you take? What is your take on the life cycle? How do you apply changes done to your QA without being destructive of production? Uh, so databases always flow down. Code always flows up. Uh, the code would go from your dev to your QA up to production, uh, but the content, the, the database itself, goes from production down to stage and dev, and then any. There's not going to be a whole lot of changes in the database, in theory. Uh, the configuration management is the biggest piece of that, and that's been kind of extracted out into its own module, so you can write out all the configuration changes into a bunch of files. You push that code, because it's treated as code at that point, because it's just a bunch of files, up to your production database, and then say, apply new well, configuration, so and so you've got it. Thing, right? so typically, I say, all right, new section of the website. Out of the site within production. 
copy paste. Yeah. There, there, there are some modules that do some like node exports and whatnot. Um, usually at the end of the day, it's cheaper to hire a bunch of interns to just mash away at control C, control V. Seriously, I mean, there, there is a, a return of the, like, how much does a, a couple of college students cost to just, you know, hack away at, at, at this? Or when you're doing your testing, you don't test with the complete live content, you just test with some sample content. And uh, then up in production, that's when you put the actual production content in. So. Okay. Um, Well, hopefully over 25. Yes. Yes. In the same way that you could do the same thing. Yes, 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 you could. You could pull out the... What kind of a system are you running? Linux, a Linux laptop? Yeah. Okay, then you've already got the, the L part of LAMP. Uh, Apache is just MySQL and PHP. You just you know, pull those in as packages. That's easy enough to do. Um, yes, and then you, you build, grab a copy of Silkscreen, set it up, configure it the way you like it, and then you can kind of take that whole thing and then just co Side copy it up. Even, even the, the content you could copy up to for the first release, you could copy up the content. Because you just grab the database and, and copy the database to whatever hosting site you have. You probably need to realize this, that these sites are dime a dozen out there. You have a simple Drupal or WordPress site. You mm -hmm. don't have silk screen, but that's... Actually, there's a, uh, there's a library that I need to get in touch with that basically sets up the pre-installs. Now, there's another piece, and that is you could do the whole thing in a DreamHost in, in a production environment. Uh, you could just install the site up in whatever hosting cloud you have, and then there's a module called Project that will allow you to browse the list of available modules, select the ones that you want, and say, download and install. And then you just start configuring up those. Find a theme that you like, download that and install it, turn it on. Uh, if you want to get more complex beyond that, beyond just basic site building, then you'll need to copy it down to your Linux laptop and things get a little more complicated. Um, not impossible, and certainly, you know, if we have some time, we can walk but you through it. But that's creating a complete new site from scratch, yeah. Mm -hmm. So yes, you could set up a, a silk screen site pretty easily. And we might just want to set up in a production environment so you could just play around with it there. Where do you want to deploy it? Are you looking for it to be something that's just running in your house, or do you want it to be something that is actually up on? Okay. Okay. So yeah, in the same place that you're hosting the website now. Okay. Well, well, you need to contact his training. Yeah. <laughs> Okay. Should, should we have, you had a question? My question is, would you want to do like an 
Sure. And I don't mean to put you on the spot. It's I will have to. It's something for you to think about and answer later. Thanksgiving, November. November 11th? I'll have to, I'll check. Okay. Just let me know and I will. Is the list and that's it. Right, the way and communicate might not be in a dead letter office. Like, but, I mean, it, it's fine either way. Yeah. Um, and that's my I, thought. Maybe the others think your idea is great. I you can request and people can reply to that. Yeah. yeah, I can. I can do that as well. But if people prefer, I'll, I'll do both. I mean, it doesn't hurt me to have the extra right. email. But no, that's fine. That's that's a valid point, and I'll I'll put a thread. But the the thing with the thread is somebody finding it, you know, in like five months from now. Yeah, we'll figure it out. All there. No. You, know, there, you had a question. It's trial and error. SQL injection is a serious issue with content management systems. Uh, the database layer already does an awful lot. Um, it, it's all based on PDO, which itself does an awful lot to help avoid SQL injection. Uh, there is a, an API for the database layer that makes it a lot easier to write safe SQL for, uh, for the site. Um, it is less of an issue than it used to be, but it's still you know, one of the, the high uh, breach issues, uh, security issues for, for any, any, kind of, any, really any website at all that has a, a database backend. So yes, I do think about that and I do, um, Drupal 7 already has a lot of stuff to protect against SQL. Backdrop continues that and actually I think improves a little bit. And yeah, the, the database plugins that I have here, uh, the drivers are very much making sure that that's, uh, they, they were encouraged to write SQL in a, a cleaner, safer way. Uh, in fact, the changes I made to create the date management stuff, you know, convert from timestamp kind of thing, to regardless of what database you're using, um, does a, a lot of the sanitizing itself so that you don't, accidentally by saying, oh, and then add in this fragment that happens to have a SQL injection bug in it. ISP events? Um, there is a thing called mod security for Apache, which is a, they call it a web firewall. And it's specifically looking for things in posts and gets in, in the URLs that are being sent in the headers uh, that include things that look like signatures of a SQL injection attack. And we'll just kind of take that URL and kick it to the curb. So yeah, yeah, ISPs do actually have a, a layer of protection as well. And every little bit helps. Anything else? All right. Thank you. Just before everyone leave, if you haven't signed in, please do. All we need is a talk. I think you have. I I counted. The only one missing are you and. I know. I'm only the only people I handed in. So and there are leftovers in the hallway. Yes, there are leftovers in the hallway. If you want to bring bagels and uh, coffee home with you, again, thank you for sponsoring. Um, and again, if any of you are looking for that next great job, looking for the next.